Thank you, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to give this talk. Um, so this is based on a joint work with Nikos from Fukinakis. Um, and uh, I'm sure all of you know what arithmetic progressions are, but I'm not sure if all of you know what degree Laurent is. So before delving into the main content of the talk, let me briefly explain what I mean by degree lowering. So degree lowering is a technique pioneered by Sarah Pelous in her work on the quantitative bounds in the polynomial similarity theorem. Um, so when you want to prove in of independence in polynomial of course, similarity. of course, of course, in a special case of the polynomial similarity <laughs> theorem. So if you want to prove bounds in, in the polynomial similarity theorem, what you want to show is that you can control the count of, of polynomial progressions by some low degree Gower's law. And the degree lowering argument allows you to do just that, to, to obtain a control by, by some low degree Gower's law. Um, so the, the first few applications of degree lowering were in combinatorics, but then the argument got adapted to ergodic theory, by first by Nikos. Um, and then there have been a few more adaptations of this argument to a more general setting. Um, but for most of the previous applications of degree lowering, the argument was used for polynomials or, or more general sequences, which exhibit some linear independence properties. With a, one exception of, of, of a paper by James Lay, all the other applications of this argument concerned some linear independent sequences. Where, whereas what I'll talk about today has nothing to do with linear independence. And this is the main way in which our paper deviates from, from the previous articles that use somehow degree lowering. So this is a, a brief introduction and uh, let me now present the, the setup. Um, so we will look at the L2 limiting behavior of the following multiple ergodic averages, where uh, we will deal with a system by which I mean an invertible measure preserving dynamical system uh, some integer sequences and, and bounded functions. Mm, the reason why we care about these averages is, of course, because of Furstenberg's multiple recurrence result. So as probably all of you know, Furstenberg proved that if we have uh, a system and a set of positive measure, then these intersections here have positive measure on average. And he used this result to give an alternative proof of this summary theorem on arithmetic progressions which says that each of the subset of natural numbers contains an arithmetic progression of arbitrary length. Um, so there are several types of questions that we can ask about multiple ergodic averages. And there are basically two ways in which we can approach, approach the problem. First, we can fix a family of sequences that we care about. These can be integral polynomials, these can be fractional powers, these can be Hardy sequences or some sequences involving primes. And uh, for this fixed family of sequences, we want to give some structural characterization on the L2 limit of the following average. So this is the first approach. We start with sequences, some family of sequences, and we want to give some characterization. But we can also approach this question from the other direction. So we can first determine what we want the limit to be. And then we, we want to give some criteria on the sequences, which give us this limit. And then um, the second question has two interesting subcases. So the, the first subcase that we can care about is when are the sequences jointly ergodic for some system in the sense that the average converges in L2 to the product of integrals. And there has been a lot of work on, on this question, starting with the work of Vitaly Bertelsson and, and, and Behren uh, from the 80s. Um, and so, so this is a well-studied question, but this is not the question that I'll focus on today. Today, I'll focus on the second interesting subcase on this problem. Um, so I want to classify the sequences A, which are, let's say, good for multiple recurrence along L-term arithmetic progressions, in the sense that the following identity is satisfied. And uh, why do we care about this property? If we can show that sequences are good for multiple recurrence along L-term arithmetic progressions, then we can use Furstenberg's multiple recurrence result to show that each the subset of integers contains an arithmetic progression of, of this form, uh, so of length L plus one, and with differences coming from, uh, from the sequence A. So, so having this property gives us a very tangible Combinatorial application, and this is why it's interesting to be able to classify such things. Um, 
So let me briefly recall some, some history of this result, probably non-exhaustive. Um, so for many families of sequences, we, we, we know that they are good for multiple recurrence along archaic progressions. So for instance, if we take an integral polynomial, then it was shown by Nikos many years ago that these sequences are good for multiple recurrence along alternate arithmetic progressions for totally ergodic systems. Um, also, Nikos proved a similar result when we look at the fractional powers of, of n, except that in this case, we don't need the assumption of total ergodicity. Uh, and more generally, this holds for all Hardy sequences, which are different enough from integral polynomials in the sense that if we subtract from it any real multiple of an integral polynomial, then the sequence grows faster than logarithm. So, so under this condition, we can get multiple recurrence along alterarchic progressions. Um, and uh, there, has, there have also been more results. So for instance, Moreira and Richter classified uh, gave some spectral conditions on the system under which these generalized linear functions are, are good for multiple recurrence. And um, as I said, probably there are more results in this direction, but just to, to give you a taste of so how. The question about yeah. Nikos is uh, bullet three. Yeah. Uh, this is the same as uniform distribution condition uh, for A from Schernitzel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <clears throat> So this question has been well studied, but if you look at all these results here, um, all these for all these sequences, we are able to show that they are both good for multiple recurrence along arbitrary arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length. Whereas our focus today is different. So we want to find necessary and sufficient conditions under which a sequence is good for multiple recurrence along arithmetic progressions of some fixed length. And there is a good reason to study this question because there are some well-known examples of sequences which are good for recurrence along L-term progressions, but not L plus one. And uh, so for instance, you can take an irrational polynomial and take the values of the irrational polynomials which are contained in some subset of the torus. And, um, and, and for this type of sequences, we will get recurrence along L-term APs, but not APs of length L plus one. So, so this is uh, the main question for, for the first part of the talk. And uh, to see what happens, let's look first at the baby case where we just have a single average. Um, so in this case, we want these two limits to, 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 to be equal, uh, which by mean ergodic theorem means that we want this average to converge to the conditional expectation to the invariant factor. Um, and, and I'm asking, when does this hold for, let's say, for all systems and for all bounded functions? Um, and it's an easy consequence of the spectral theorem to, to show that this happens even only if the following exponential sum goes to zero for all irrational values alpha. So for this single average, we get this, this very nice condition. Um, and uh, let's see what happens for longer averages now. But in order to do this, let me very briefly summarize the host graph theory. Some, some, let me give some basic facts from this that I'll use throughout the rest of the talk. Um, so in their seminar paper from, from about 20 years ago, host and crowd defined a family of seminars that can be used to control multiple ergodic averages. Um, so, so this family of same norms is indexed by, by natural numbers, um, and um, it's useful because, for instance, for linear averages of length L, we can show that the L2 limit is controlled by some constant times the minimum of the degree L semi-norm of any of the functions. And this is all under the assumptions that the functions are bounded by one, but since we're working in the L infinity setting, we can always make this assumption happen. And I'll also make this assumption implicitly or explicitly for the rest of the talk that everything is bounded by one. Um, so, um, so this is the, the original motivation for these semi-norms, but later on there have been many more results which show that the semi-norms control much more general families of averages in the sense that if any of the functions has a zero semi-norm of some fixed degree, then the limit of the average is zero. Um, these semi-norms are very structured. They satisfy a lot of nice properties. One of the most important ones is the monotonicity property. 
This property is important because it tells us that somehow controlling an average by a low degree semi-norm is in general a harder task than controlling it by, by, by a larger degree semi-norms. And um, as I'll see shortly, there are some very obvious advantages of getting a control over an average by a semi-norm of low degree. Um, and why is it so? Um, so first, let me mention here that these semi-norms are connected with a certain family of factors. Uh, and and uh, they're connected in the following sense, that the null space of the semi-norm of degree S um, corresponds to functions which are orthogonal to, to a certain factor, which we call the Hoskra factor of degree S minus one. Um, and these factors have a lot of nice structural properties. So for instance, the factor Z0 is the invariant factor. Um, for ergodic transformations, the factor Z1 is the Kronecker factor, i.e. the factor generated by angle functions. And for more general values of S, we know that Zs is an inverse limit of S step in systems, which are highly structured algebraic systems. And, and this last statement is, is very deep and is the content of what is often called the structure theorem of Host and Crow. Um, and of course, these semi norms satisfy many more properties, but these are somehow the essential properties that. Um, that, that, that we need and, uh, and uh, that, that are used in most of, of, of the applications of, of these semi-norms. Um, so let me get back to this case where we have a single average and, and we have this uh, equivalent conditions, which I stated previously. In the light of the whole square theory that I described, we can rephrase these conditions in two more alternative ways. So the first way is that this identity holds even only if it holds for all Z1 functions. And this has to do with the fact that we can, to, to get this identity, we can always pass to an ergodic component. And uh, for an ergodic system, the Z1 functions are generated by eigenfunctions of the system. The second way of stating this is that for every one step new manifolds and for every ergodic new rotation on this new manifold, the following sequence is equidistributed in, in any manifold. So EX here denotes the identity elements of, of this new manifold. So this is maybe a more complicated way of stating this condition, but essentially it follows from the fact that, that one step in manifolds can be written down as, as tori times cyclic groups. So this is the, the baby case, the, the case L equal to one. And, uh, what can we say about the longer case? And here there is a fairly old by now conjecture made by Fradzikinakis, Johnson, Lazin, and Wirth, which essentially generalizes whatever I said on the previous slide. So let's, let's fix some natural number L and an integer sequence. So this conjecture says that for all systems and all bounded functions, this identity holds even only if for every ergodic new rotation on an L step new manifold, the following system, the following sequence, sorry, is equidistributed in the new manifold. So somehow this conjecture reduces uh, showing this identity to showing an equidistribution property on, on L step new manifolds. Um, and, uh, and, and, and why is it so? so for, for the implication one, one implies two, morally this implication is a consequence of Hall square theorem, which, uh, which, which, uh, which allows us to reduce the, the ZL factors to, to L step new systems. Um, and what's, what's difficult here is the second implication. So what's difficult here is, is to show that if we can show that if we have this property that, that this identity actually holds. Um, and, um, and an important fact is that for arbitrary sequences, we cannot really replace L step new systems with L minus one step new systems uh, because essentially of examples like those that I gave on one of the previous slides. So, so various uh, sequences that come from, from certain values of, of degree L plus one polynomials. Um, so this is the conjecture. That's this kind of an inspiration for what we've tried to do. And, um, and before I state one of our first results, let me briefly recall 
one notion. So I'll say throughout this talk many times that a certain seminorm and, and specifically a certain whole square seminorm controls a certain average. If for all bounded functions, the average goes to zero whenever the seminorm uh, of at least one of the functions is zero. So, so this is the kind of infinitary way in which we use these whole square seminorms to control the limiting behavior of our averages. Um, and uh, essentially what we have shown here is that if we have a seminal control, then we can get the conjecture that uh, I stated on the previous slide. So let's fix some natural number L and let's fix some integers K1 through KL and, and some system. And uh, suppose that some whole square seminorm of potentially very large degree controls this average in the sense that, again, the average goes to zero if one of the functions has a, a zero seminorm. And then under this assumption, the following two statements are equivalent. So under this assumption, this identity holds even only if it holds for all ZL functions. So this is, uh, this is statement one number one. It essentially allows us to reduce the, the question of showing this identity to showing it to all ZL functions. And, uh, and moreover, uh, we have a second statement which allows us to, to reduce the question of showing this identity to showing an equidistribution of certain all orbits on l stabilian systems. So suppose that we have some minor control for some fixed L, but for, for all the integers and all the systems. Um, and then the identity that, and, and then this identity holds for all systems and in all case, even only if um, for, for every L step new manifolds and every ergodic new rotation on such a new manifold, the following orbit is equidistributed in the new manifold. So essentially, we, re, we, we prove the, the conjecture from the previous slide, but under the extra assumption that we have some global control over the average. Um, the point here, though, is that, um, is that uh, we can we can control this. We, we assume that we can control this uh, this average by an arbitrary seminorm of possibly of very high degree, and and somehow in order to verify this identity, we can make this jump to 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 ZL measurable functions. So we can assume that we have only control by the seminorm of degree L plus one. Sorry, can I just ask uh, yeah. when you assume um, some control? It, it's Ah, okay. So the first segment is for a fixed system. Which yes. May or may not be a god. Exactly. Yeah. So for a single average, it doesn't really matter because you can pass from. Uh, you can use ergodic, the composition to pass to ergodic systems. So you can somehow always only restrict to the case where you have ergodic systems. Um, if you want for a non-ergodic system, then yeah, you'd have to show it for all ergodic components, I suppose. But. Uh, but there is nothing in this statement that essentially uses ergodicity. When you say that you're seminal control for all K and all systems, uh, do you mean that there's a uniform S that controls all of them? Uh, that's a good question, but I don't think. No, no, no. no. Yeah. So the point is, once you have seminal control for, for every single one, there is an S, then you can uh, bring S down to L. I mean, uh, Plus one. It doesn't matter that S could depend on K or the system. No. It doesn't matter because no, we only use it inside a system and we okay. do very tight. Okay. We, we don't have to assume for every system. Okay. Fix system. Let me maybe restate it again. So 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 what's the goal? The goal is to show that this identity holds. And what our work theorem tells is that in order to, to do this, we need to first obtain some control over the first average. By, pot, by a seminorm of a potentially very high degree. And then we have we can proceed in two ways. Either we can verify this identity for L stable systems, or um, it suffices to show that, um, that the whole following orbit is equidistributed 
whenever B induces an ergodic new rotation on an L step in line state. So somehow the idea is that you only have to check this average for kind of one degree up. So, so for um, only for, for ZL uh, functions. Um, and uh, one might ask, well, for, for what sequences this would hold or this wouldn't hold? And, um, and perhaps uh, one thing to note at this point is that uh, if A is a polynomial, then we would not expect this identity to hold in general because uh, integral polynomials have some local obstructions. And so we would only expect this identity to hold for, for total ergodic transformations. And this has actually been, been proved by, by Nikos some years ago. And a simple example for why this is the case is if we take our system to be just a rotation on two points, and if we take our polynomial to be just 2n, then, then TAN is always the identity map. So on the left, this average will always be equal to f, whereas on the right, it will converge to the integral because T here is an ergodic transformation. So somehow for ergodic, but not total ergodic systems and for polynomials, uh, this, this thing need not hold. Uh, but we have a variant also that holds for, for, for sequences like polynomials, which, in, which have some local obstructions. So, so let's fix an L again and let's fix some integers and let's, let's, let's take a total ergodic system. And let's suppose that some Hochschild semi-norm, again, of potential very high degree, controls this average. And then the following are equivalent. So um, this identity holds for, for all functions, even only if it holds for ZL functions. And, uh, and again, we can somehow deduce this identity from, um, from, from rotations on total ergodic systems. So if we have semi non control for all total ergodic new systems and all K1 through KK, KL, um, sorry, what did I do? Yeah, here I am. Uh, then we can deduce this identity if we know that the following orbit is equidistributed for every total ergodic new rotation on an l stemming manifold, or equivalently for every ergodic new rotation on every connected l stemming manifold. Um, so, so, so these are the statements that we have for arithmetic progressions. And let me pause here for a second to, to ask if there are any more questions. One of the implications is zero. Uh, between which ones? Sorry. One implies two. So here, one implies two trivially because here we want this to hold for all functions, whereas here we only want to. Oh, I mean, by the more. But sorry. Ah, uh, from so actually for total ergodic mean systems, we have that this statement implies the identity. But in the other direction here, we have not been able to, to prove it for some stupid technical reason. And probably one should also imply this moreover statement, but uh, we just haven't been able to deduce it. Whereas for, for in the previous slide, what we had so for, uh, for, for arbitrary sequences where we don't have these local abstractions, three is actually equivalent to one under. And then which implication is easier? Uh, yes, yeah. so um, three is uh, essentially equivalent to two. The way we argue is that basically one implies two. That's, that's easy. The difficult thing that we have to show is that two implies one, and this is really the, the content, whereas two is equivalent to three follows by some more or less standard arguments. So in one way, you, you use the Hoskell structure theorem, in the other way, you approximate new sequences by some multi-correlation sequences. Um, I think these arguments, that they are carried out in our paper. They are also, some of them, I don't know if you first use these arguments or if they were used somewhere else, but, uh, but yeah, so, so two, two is equivalent to three is more or less standard, whereas the, the, the main content really is, is between here. So two or three implies one, this is better. Yeah. Um, so let me now move to a higher level of generality and discuss the real thing that we worked about, because the questions, the, the, the theorems that I 
showed previously are just some special cases of a much more general result. So let's suppose we have some arbitrary collection of integral sequences, right? And let's take a system. Um, and the question that we want to ask is, when does a whole square seminar of some fixed degree S control the average of this form? Or equivalently, if you prefer the language of factors, when is the Hoskra factor of degree S minus one characteristic for this average? So again, the focus here is on a fixed S. We want to know when this happens for some fixed S. Um, and, and this is the, the, the statement that we proved. So suppose that some Hoskra semilon controls this average, again, of potentially very, very high degree. Um, and suppose also that, that um, we know that the degree S seminal controls this average for all ZS functions. Then we can show that the seminal controls this average for all bounded functions. So essentially there are, we can restate it as follows. So um, if we have some, <laughs> by some whole square semino of potentially very high degree, then um, the semino of degree S controlling this average for all functions is equivalent to this being the case only for ZS functions. So somehow under this semino control assumption to, to check that degree S semino controls it, it suffices to check it for ZS functions. And um, why does it make sense to make such distinction? This is because the two conditions that we have to check in order for the seminal degree S to, to control this average usually follow by some very different methods. So usually in order to show that the Hoshka seminal of, of some arbitrary degree controls this average, we run some version of the, of the PET induction scheme. Um, whereas in order to show the second statement so that um, degree S semino controls the average for all ZS functions. This usually uses some equidistribution properties, which, which this can be either equidistribution on the tori or this could be equidistribution new systems. But but this this part of the argument is usually very different. Um, so if you don't like factors like me, for instance, you can also think about these things purely in terms of seminar. So um, so so we want to check. To, to, to show that degree S seminal controls the average, we want to check two things. First, we want to check that we have a control by some whole square seminal. And then we have to check that degree S plus one control implies degree S control. And under these two assumptions, we have degree S control. So this is the statement. Any questions here? So one could see for S is equal to one, why this is. S and this I'll have on the, on the next slide, yeah. Yeah. So if I were interested in a quantitative version of this, sorry. So does your argument go from very large S to minus one, minus two, minus two? Exactly. Like, that's hidden in the background, but it's just that you condense that into a single condition, which implies that you can do it at every step. Is that? Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I, and I hope to show it more through. Uh, actually when I give you a sketch of the proof for, for how this goes. Um, so as a special case, our result recovers an earlier result of Nikos on joint ergodicity. So we say that sequences are jointly ergodic for, an, uh, for, for some ergodic system, even only if the average converges to the product of integrals. Um, and Nikos proved that sequences are jointly ergodic, uh, even only if the two things follow. So first, the average is controlled by some Hoshka seminal, and second, this identity holds when the functions are eigenfunctions. And uh, actually, we can restate this result in the language of, of the previous slide. So joint ergodicity, meaning this identity, corresponds to degree one control. And this is because for ergodic systems, the degree one seminorm equals to the absolute value of the integral of f. Uh, same thing, the, the fact that the, the statement that the identity holds for eigenfunctions is equivalent to it holding for all Z1 functions. And this is because for an ergodic transformation, the Z1 factor is generated, is the same as Kronecker factor, so it's generated by the eigenfunctions. So the result that Nikos proved previously can be restated as follows, that we have degree one control 
if and only if we can control this average by some Postgres semi-norm, and if we have degree one control for all Z1 functions. So this is a restatement of, of the joint ergodicity criteria. And what we did in, in our paper is basically extended this statement to, to arbitrary S. So we replaced one at every place by arbitrary S. This is really um, what we have done. Um, so let me give you some idea of how we prove this result and where the degree lowering argument comes into play. And this, is, this corresponds to the question that, that Freddie asked before. So let's consider the following modern case where we have a double average. And let's suppose that by some pet argument or some other magic, we can control it by degree four semi norm. And let's also suppose that we know that degree three control implies degree two control in the sense that if our functions are Z2 measurable, then for this selected family of functions, we can control the average by the degree two norm. And what I'm claiming is that from these two assumptions, by combining them, we can control the average by a degree to semi norm. And um, for the rest of the talk, I will also assume for convenience that, that all the averages that I'm looking at converge in L2. But let me point out that this assumption is not, not necessary. We have ways of going about this. So, so the L2 convergence that you'll see implicitly here is purely for, for convenience. <laughs> Um, so first, the, the argument for this proceeds by, proceeds by induction uh, as follows. So first, we prove these results when both of the functions are Z2 measurable. And here, there is actually nothing to show. This just follows from, from, our, uh, from our assumption here, that for Z2 functions, we already have degree two control. So somehow, this is the base case, which for us is a part of our assumptions. Then we pass to a more complicated case where only one of the functions is Z2 measurable. And we tackle this case by reducing it to the first case, by replacing the non-Z2 measurable function by some Z2 measurable thing. And lastly, we prove the result for arbitrary functions. And this we also do by induction, by inductively invoking the second case where one of the two functions is Z2 measurable. So, so that's how the induction scheme here goes. And, the, and here are the tools that we use for this particular case. So the first thing that we use is the, the standard induction formula for seminorms. It allows us to express the degree four seminorm as an average of the degree three seminorms, but of the uh, multiplicative derivatives of f. Um, the second thing that we use is the weak inverse theorem for the degree three seminorm. Um, why is it weak? So this, this, this theorem is just a restatement of the definition. So it allows us to express the degree three seminorm as a, as a correlation of F and the dual function of degree three. Um, and, and this degree three dual function is Z2 measurable, which is important fact for our purposes. And lastly, we also use more or less implicitly this identification that a function has degree three seminorm even only if it's orthogonal to the Z2 factor. But at no stage in the argument, we actually use the Hoskra structured theorem. So we nowhere really need to know that the Z2 factor is an inverse limit of two stadium systems. So somehow for us, new systems are completely out of the game here. And our argument is elementary in the sense that it allows us to, to circumvent all these, all these properties that, that new systems enjoy it. Particularly, you, you could handle other group accuracies, the actions in principle. Uh, Say that again, sir. I mean, so, so um, in, in your talk, you, you've been working, you've been uh, working on uh, only the Z actions. Like yes. Yeah, yeah. But if you're not used to the structure theory, in principle, your arguments would work for, for arbitrary, so they uh, would be in group actions. Probably, but we haven't tried it. Like we haven't checked if there are other difficulties, but yeah, possibly. Would be interesting yeah. to check. Yeah, as long as you know the structure theory, which yes. would be generally, you know, thank you. Yeah, that was the same with my first answer. I just uh, yeah, we just write it for Z. So yeah. we're simple people. Yeah. Could be a Our joint ergodicity has been checked for the others. So how do we do this? Um, the the key idea, and this is something that that Sir Apelus came up with, is that if we have this 
the L2 norm of this ergodic average, we can express it as an inner product of F2 with some structured function big F. Um, this, this function big F has a very explicit structure, is an average over, over things of this form. And if you plug this definition in here and do some simple change of variables, you'll very easily see that this identity holds. Um, and why is, this, why is this useful? So if we now use this fact and apply the cauchy schwarz inequality to get rid of F2, we can bound the original average by the L2 norm of big F. And then we can, uh, we can express this as an inner product of F with itself and replacing one of the Fs by what we get in this definition we will see immediately almost that, that this L2 norm equals to the following thing. And if we further use the cauchy schwarz to remove G, we can bound this by the L2 norm of this function. So what we did here is that allowing the loss of the exponent four, we're able to replace the original average with some arbitrary function F2 by an average of the same form, but where F2 is replaced by this much structured and explicitly given function F. So this is the first trick. We can replace an arbitrary thing by a structured thing. Um, and then, so, so this is what we get here. And then let's assume, let's use our assumption that averages of this form are controlled by the degree four semi-norm. I'll use this by contrapositive. So, so if this thing is positive, then this thing is also positive. And from the assumption of degree four control, we deduce that the degree four semi-norm of the structure function f is positive. And, and note here one important fact. So for arbitrary bounded function, we have the monotonistic property of Hochschild semi-norms, which tells us that this identity almost holds. But the, the special structure of these, of these functions, big F, these, these structure functions, allows us to prove the crucial degree lowering property so that the, the inequality in some sense goes in the other direction. Namely that if, if the degree four semi-norm of big F is positive, then the degree three semi-norm of F is positive. So this is the, the key property here. And let's assume that we have it for now. Um, so if we have this property, then we can invoke the, the weak inverse theorem for, for the semi-norm to express it as an, as an integral of F with the degree three dual function. Um, and if in this integral, we substitute for F the formula that we have, we can deduce after some simple change of variables and cauchy schwarz inequality that the following inequality holds. So to summarize briefly what we did, initially we had this inequality but with an arbitrary F2 function here. Then we passed to the case where we have just this, the structure function F here. And then at the, at the next step, we pass to the case where we have the degree three dual function here. And now the degree three dual function is Z2 measurable. So we re have reduced in our induction scheme to this case where we have the same average, but with one of the functions being Z2 measurable. And at this step, we, we invoke the induction hypothesis, which, which tells us that if one of the functions is Z2 measurable, then we have the degree two control. And we invoke this to deduce that that this statement implies that we have degree two control on F1. And then somehow by some, by some easy maneuvers, we can also extract a similar estimate for degree two uh, semi-norm of F2, okay? So this is roughly how the argument goes. Uh, and really the, the key property, the one that, that, that allows us to do all of this is this degree low end property that, that I mentioned before, namely that the positivity of the, of the degree four semi-norm of the dual function implies the positivity of the degree three semi-norm. Um, and let me give more details about this part because this is really, the, the whole setup up to now is, or, or more or less most of the setup up to now is, is just due to Palouse and then Palouse Brandeville, but let us, show, let us show a bit more how this thing goes to, to show somehow how the special properties of dual functions allow us to deduce this degree lowering property. Um, so, so the first step to show it is to replace, to express the degree four uh, semi-norm of F using the induction formula as degree three average over degree three semi-norms on different multiplicative derivatives of F. 
And then we use the, the weak inverse formula for degree three semi-norms to express this as an integral of uh, the, the, the delta HF with the degree three dual function of itself. Uh, and, uh, and, and what do we have then? Um, so we have showed that this basically, the positivity of this implies the positivity of this expression. Um, and the next step is a, is a technical and messy, but not really conceptually complicated step that is often called dual difference interchange. So somehow we, we unpack the definition of F here. We have two Fs here, right? Because this is F times THF. So we unpack the definition of F, and then after some cauchy schwarzing we can show that the positivity of this thing implies the positivity of this expression. This is awful and complicated, but let me try to give you an idea of what's going on here. So we have some averaging parameters here, and we have an L2 norm of an average, where here we have some bounded functions that depend on our averaging parameters. But what's important is what happens here. So here we, we got um, basically two products of degree two dual functions, one with h and one with h prime. And, um, and, and each of these functions individually is, is z2 measurable. Hence, also their product is z2 measurable. So once again, we apply the induction hypothesis for the averages where one of the functions is z2 to conclude from here that the following average is, is positive. So that if we average over all h and h prime, then the, the degree two semi-norm of, of this thing is positive. The reason why we have degree two semi-norm is because induction hypothesis gives us precisely that we can control this by degree two semi-norms of these functions. And, um, and, and, and we also have the averaging, so, so we get basically that this average is, is positive. And the kind of key technical observation that we noticed is that from this average, we can deduce that the function f itself has degree three semi-norm positive. And this is perhaps the, the, the technically interesting part of the argument the, because we here we discovered some identities or some implications that we don't think have been known previously. Um, so I'll explain now in the, in the last bits of, of this presentation how or, or, or why this implies this. And by the way, this, this implication here doesn't use or in any way the, the, the special properties of F. So this holds for, for any, any, any function. But before I'll get to this complicated case, let me start with some simple cases. So it's well known from whole scratch structure theory that if we have degree S semi-norm, if it's zero, then the degree S semi-norm of the degree S dual function of the same function is also zero. Um, this, is there an easy way to see it? So if this is zero, then F is orthogonal to the Z S minus one factor. Uh, and, and this function is, is Z S minus one measurable. Uh, so somehow, I don't know, but it's, it's I, I don't want to derive it now, but, but this thing follows pretty easily from, from the, some basic properties of, of host cross seminars. Um, and the interesting thing is that we can boost this implication to the statement where we have degree s plus one dual function here instead of degree s. This is not, it's, it's not immediately obvious why this is the case. And in order to give some intuition, let's look at how this follows for s equal to one and for ergodic transformation. So, uh, for ergodic transformation t, the degree one semi-norm is just the absolute value of the integral of f. So it's zero whenever f has zero integral. Um, and uh, the degree one semi-norm of, of this d2f is, is also the absolute value of the integral. So we want to show that this integral is zero now. Um, and uh, for those, and, and, and if we look at what this integral is, then it turns out we can express it as an average over a single parameter of this function. So of some constant CH, which is very explicitly given, times THF. 
Uh, and now if we pull the constant out of the integral and if we compose with th using the invariance, we get that the integral of df d to f is just an average, a weighted average of times the integral of f. And since the integral of f is zero, then this whole thing is also zero. And because of this, it, it follows that f has zero integral, then so does d to f. And hence, we get an analogous statement for the same norms for s equal to one. And a more complicated argument, sorry, this statement, and a more complicated argument gives the statement for, for higher values of s as well. You just have to yeah, run it a, a, a bit more. Um, uh, and so this is one implication, but we can also get a stronger implication if we, if with averaging here, if we raise the degree here by one. So if now f has a vanishing seminal of degree s plus one, then this implies that the average of uh, now the product, sorry, if, if we now take the product of dual functions of degree s plus one dual functions of multiplicative derivatives, and if we average over the values of f h prime, uh, then this whole thing is zero. And we can further boost this statement if we if we raise the degree by one here. So if we allow s plus two seminal here, then we get the same thing, but um, but but now we will have an average over four parameters, and we will take the dual functions over uh, basically the, the product of four dual functions here. So these identities are kind of well not obvious at all that this holds and uh, not even clear where this comes from, but they turn out to hold and they turn out to play a, a crucial part in our argument of, of the in our proof of the degree lowering property. Uh, so let me make some some further comments here. Um, so I so this is our result again, and uh, I told you that in the case s equal to one, it recovers the the the, the result previously proved separately by Nikos, but we use a very a rather different proof for from what Nikos did. So um, basically, Nikos used the usual inverse theorem for the U two seminorm, which says that the function has a positive U two seminorm even only if it has a non negative correlation with some eigenfunction. We don't use this this inverse theorem at all. We only use the, the theorem that the f has a positive uh, degree to seminorm if it correlates non-trivially with its own dual function of degree two. So so there is a technical difference here. We we use different inverse theorem, and and somehow this technical difference allows us to prove this result for higher values of s because for for higher values of s we can still express a degree s seminorm very easily using this inverse theorem as a correlation with degree s dual function, whereas it's a bit harder to find an analog for the U2 inverse theorem for higher value of, of s. So what we could try to do uh, alternatively would be to show that uh, if f has a, a positive seminal of degree s, then it correlates non-negatively with, let's say, some s minus one stable character. And this is an approach that we originally tried. Uh, but well, we wrote down something. It got very messy, very technical. We didn't even complete, uh, and, and and maybe it would have worked, but it would be awful to read. Um, whereas somehow avoiding the new characters and avoiding inverse theorems of, of this form, which is structure structure theory, allowed us to simplify the argument quite considerably. And I think on this note, I will finish. Thank you. Yeah, more questions, maybe. Yeah, I have some. So, um, uh, two. so uh, one is if is it just only Cauchy Schwartz here, or are there any, if I for doing this in the quantitative setting and the planetary setting? Are there any stages where you're secretly applying a regularity then, or is it just close to what's close to what's and you can do it that way? Um, so we don't apply regularity lemma, but the problem that if we wanted to, let's say, move this argument to the finitary setting in order to, I know, prove some bounds for polynomial similarity theorem or something, the problem is that we make this assumption here that, so we want to show that this identity, that, that this thing is controlled by degree S semi-norm for some fixed S. But we proved it under the assumption 
that this holds for all ZS functions. And somehow in, in the finitary setting, if we wanted to verify this assumption, then we would have to show that we have certain equidistribution property on S terminal systems. Somehow the, the thing is that we outsource the problem to, to the assumption. So, so we assume that I mean, you wouldn't you don't have to phrase it in terms of null sequences, you could phrase it in terms of probability to ZS dual functions, and then I mean, right, then maybe that just kicks the can down the road, then you have to worry about how else you prove that. Yeah, but you yeah. think not trivial measurability on the athletic side. The majority of that usually corresponds to using regular. Right, right, exactly. So, so I guess I'm asking, suppose I tell you that you have this, um, if I put a, a degree S dual function in every position, then the whole thing is, uh, is controlled by the ZS minus one. I have a ZS plus one dual function in every position that is controlled by the ZS norm or something. If I give you that statement explicitly, combinatorially, is anything else you're doing um, going to have full bounds or is it just? It's only because is one. Just because you thought, okay, yeah, yeah. Then you think, so for this argument, I'm... I think that, 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 that can you explain what exactly you mean here by regularity now in this context? So, well, what Terry said, and anytime you project onto the sigma algebra of CS measurable functions, that will probably correspond in the um finite free setting to saying take the projection onto you know onto the sigma algebra plus the orthogonal complement. Plus a small L2 error, and that will be a regularity type statement, which will have your type bounds. So that, that would be a mess. Okay. So your question was if they would finitize their stuff with the regularity, then it would be relevant? Yes, yes. So whether it's just purely Cauchy Schwartz. I think the answer is it's just purely Cauchy Schwartz. So, yeah. so probably actually you could use Hanbanak type decompositions as a substitute for. Uh, um, if you can do it purely using Hanbanak, that's a good thing to say you can just do it using Cauchy Schwartz in the setting, as far as I know. Yeah. 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 But I mean, that's, 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 that's for two this. So I mean, yeah. I, it is, it's, 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 it's quite likely. I see. But to continue this, and I'm curious now, so this is infinite reward, at least for me, right? But is there potential, interesting potential to finitization of this? Yeah, it looks, it looks quite likely. It, it should yeah. be, yeah. as far as I can tell, you can just do it. I, yeah, I no, my, my I, question was, oh, <laughs> there is potential to do it. Okay, I, I bet you can. Try to finitize anything. Yeah, yeah but I mean, but it's also standing you have a lot of bounds. But to, uh, that's my question. So, yeah. will it give something interesting? If in applications, uh, yeah, it might give some sort of like rather type economy or something, um, like a quantitative rather to come. Like uh, either these averages are within epsilon of each other always, or there's a not, there's a noticeable lack of equity distribution. See what I don't feel uh, about uh, the moment we finitize, at least in my intuition, I totally lose uh, understanding where the potency will enter the picture. And they are using the potency heavily, right? Because so we don't use the new potency in this, the proof of this statement. No, no, but when heavily in the following sense, your <coughs> equivalent statements here would be about uh, new factors, isn't it? In what sense? Well, all these uh, ZS factors, they're of an important nature. So you're referring to like the third equivalent condition that you had earlier, right? But you had your other equivalent condition that you yeah, check so equidistribution. If you want to check that you have some averages being equal, you just check that. Uh, yeah, so basically for system. the applications and logarithmic progressions, we phrase them in terms of your know, system. So the third equivalent condition, of course, to, to Show the equivalence of one with three. You, you, and you this system. condition, uh, an equivalent condition would be checking the uh, income distribution. Or yes, many. but this statement has no reference to many things. This is a statement that you can just uh, read the prover using Cossis large without any reference. But maybe what Vitaly is saying is, is that but your main theorem actually does imply a consequence for acquisition of no metaphors, which is proven without almost any reference to the metaphors. Thing. And if, if you want to test that a certain average converges to what you expect for all degree, yeah, um, large degree, no systems, yeah. it's to, to, to verify for low, de uh, low yeah. degree, no, no systems, which if you try to prove it directly using no system theory, that could be a, be a more difficult proof. Yeah. Yeah. For the original yeah. one, or, uh, yeah, the first theorem, yes, of course, we reduce this uh, nearly. So for me, kind of the motivation to study is these things to, to get 
the motivation for me actually comes from the finitary setting to, to get bounds in some more cases of the polynomial summary theorem. Uh, but uh, in this case, as far as I can tell for now, the, the challenge is basically to prove this assumption that some, some version, some finitary version of the assumption that the identity holds for ZS functions, because at least so far, I haven't been able to see the, how to prove this without actually passing through the systems and without using the, the inverse theorem for Gower's uh, But it will be interesting to see whether in the combinatorial, combinatorial setting one could somehow rephrase this assumption uh, without reference to new systems or maybe use some, I don't know what exactly, because I still haven't I think figured out. The only thing this could be useful without being since instead of verifying things, let's say for three step nil system, uh, verify you do your higher order for your analysis, whatever for two step nil systems. That's the only thing. And I'm, my, my student James is playing with things like that, uh, trying to, to apply the loose theory to systems of complexity one or complexity two and get reasonable bounds because the, the, the inverse U2 and inverse U3 theorems. Uh, Includes his original theory, you know, was taking S equals zero, basically. Yeah. So I'm saying complexity zero systems, but yeah, mm -hmm. say. But he still will, uh, whatever implications he will arrive at, uh, it will be some degree of independence of the polynomials. Yeah, he can have, yeah, there'll be some assumptions on the problem, yeah. which is that. But, but mainly that complexity is, is low. The, 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 I also had a second question, but yeah. No. So, uh, well, yeah, I was going to ask, I think it's related to what Terry just said. Uh, so, you, you know how to handle um, uh, joint ergodicity and you know how to handle regressions now. Mm -hmm. uh, can you get more in between those two? So, if you have some linear pretenders in the ergodic setting, or? Yeah. In principle. I mean, this hypothesis. hypothesis. Yeah, this hypothesis applies to any, any production series. They don't have to be dependent. So the pro arithmetic progressions are just, I put this in the beginning because it's maybe the most interesting special case, but in principle, you can take any sequences here. These don't have to be arithmetic progressions. And the result we proved for arbitrary sequences, like that, we, we took arithmetic progressions as just a corollary. Amazing what you can do just with Hashish force. Yeah. <laughs> Powerful. Yeah. So, yeah, my other question is going to show it's a technical one. So, as I understand it, your hypothesis is that uh, you have US control in for every function, uh, provided it's ZS measurable, whatever. If you have different controls of different degrees for different functions, does your method uh, go through or is that? So, that's a very interesting question. And in principle, it should come through. But if I recall our argument correctly, there is, it doesn't, because the problem is that when all but one functions are, let's say, ZS measurable, then you want somehow to reduce to the case where all of them are ZS measurable. So this transition holds where we have the, the same level of uniformity for all the functions, but at least with the argument that we have, it breaks if we have different levels of uniformity. So actually the argument is very fine-tuned, like to this, to this, the same is very fine-tuned to these details there. And, and similar issue on one of your papers. Yeah, yeah, that's what I asked. Okay. <laughs> and for similar issues, maybe we haven't really been able to extend this to several commuting transformations. Because also this case where one but all but one functions are Z as measurable, somehow passing from this to the base case also causes problems when you have several different transformations. And of course, it would be curious to actually extend this to these two cases that we talked about, but oh, there are some, some, some interesting issues there, which make it hard. So it shows up in the original Pulis thing of the average of, of, of n and n squared. Like the, 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 it's not completely symmetric how it has to treat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, any, any other question? Can I ask another question? So, so, yeah, so this main theorem is like you can lower the degree uh, 
online, but you also need some absolute like bet induction magic or whatever to get some uh, yes. across them, you know, yeah. to control the average. Is that, um, how, how far is that assumption from say, it works for weak mixing systems? Weak mixing systems, that's which assumption that. Uh, so if, yeah, if some seminar controls the average, then for every weak mixing system, uh, you know what the limit is because there are no, I mean, all the seminars are zero anyway. Um, could these two conditions be equivalent? Maybe that's my question. It's actually an interesting question, but I don't know. Obviously, in practice, they're equivalent, but they yeah. probably do. <laughs> they're, 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 they're artificial. I mean, you might put an artificial example. Um, yeah. where it's not. That, that's my guess. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, there's reason thinking related to right, the distal factor of the system is bigger than the distal factor. And so that might be nice. Yeah, but like, like it is average. Is average. Yeah. It is average. Just see the difference. That's the question. Maybe you can say the artificial example, maybe. Okay. Yeah, you get to complete these specimens. It is a complete arbitrary object, but you could potentially do something with some weird type of argument. So basically, you're saying that it would be interesting to know whether we have seminar control for all systems if we have it for a weak mixing system. Right? Yeah. yeah, although yeah. it seems maybe the answer is no. Yeah. No, no, for it, no for it. probably yeah. in any sense, when I get three group, yeah, I'm trying to see weak mixing systems you have in the size of group. So yeah, because I, I, I don't think we know how to do this. But that's I usually how it works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How can you speak with other than by large but finite numbers of Cauchy Schwartz? Uh, possibly, is it just infinitely many Cauchy Schwartz? Yeah, and uh, and uh, alpha tends to a number for building the element of the gamma example. It works for the weak mixing system, but it's not good. For and what's the example? Uh, because what the example? Uh, it's not. Oh, what was the question? No, 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 no. It, 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 it's okay. You should go to the last one. The, the, the third time, it's not the first time. You should think of the third time. Yeah, but in practice, it probably doesn't make proving anything in any application easier. Uh, yeah. It's a bit cleaner sometimes to write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't write this. I have you here. Maybe you should thank the speaker. <laughs> <laughs>